Welcome to Golden Zoomies. My name is Janet Patterson Kane. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer of the Morris Animal Foundation. I'd like to particularly welcome the hero owners and veterinarians who are attending today. Uh, the purpose of Golden Zoomies is so you can meet some of the scientists and hear about the projects and studies that we're doing with the data that's coming in from our golden retrievers, both data and samples. Uh, start off with, I'd just like to get the internal team to introduce themselves. So Amy, could you get us started? Hi everyone, I'm Amy Torres. I'm the Executive Assistant for Scientific Programs. Um, I'm gonna help out with driving the presentations today. Nice to see everyone here. And Emily. Hi everyone, I am Emily. I am the Girls Operations Coordinator and I'm gonna be helping out with the um, the Q&A questions and chat and that kind of stuff today. Okay, and do we have an instruction, any instructions here today, Emily, for the people attending? Yep, I think Amy is working on pulling that slide. Amy's going to pull it up, good. Yep, and but you know, can... I'll, I'll try and get to all your questions today, don't worry. Sometimes we don't get to all of them, but we'll uh, do the best that we can. Okay, some instructions, please listen to these. Okay, so um, just some overview here. The Q we have Q&A sessions planned um, to take place at the end of each presentation that is time permitting. So um, each talk will be about 15 minutes. And then if there is extra time, we'll do those Q&As. If you want to have a question considered for Q&A, you'll want to submit it um, using the Q&A feature, not chat. And so if you look at the very bottom of your screen down there, there's a few different icons. The Q&A one says, of course, Q&A and has two chat bubbles. Chat is how you're going to talk to um, Amy and I, and that's how we'll see if there's any tech issues, any questions unrelated to um, our speakers. So that's gonna say chat and have one bubble. We also have closed captioning available and you can turn it off and on by hitting the live transcript button, which is a square with a CC in it. Um, and that will help you either see the subtitles or hide them. Excellent. So just remember questions in the Q&A, not questions in the chat, so we won't be able to keep track of them. Okay, let's get that slide down. And we're gonna start with our first speaker for today. And I'm just really pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Holly Gantz. And Holly, if you could perhaps introduce yourself, tell us about the things that you're doing, and then give us your talk. Thank you so much. I'm Holly Gantz. I'm a microbial ecologist. I spent a lot of my career studying coevolution and disease ecology before turning to the microbiome. Um, I did work at UC Davis and UC Berkeley prior to starting a company to try and help companion animals have better gut health, um, animal biome. And we are so um, thrilled to be collaborating with the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study, and I'm really excited to tell you about the work that we're going to be doing with some of the fecal samples that have been collected so far. And I don't, I can't tell if the slides are going or not. Looks like they're not up quite yet. I think Amy is okay. working on getting those okay. up. Okay, we won't we won't leave you hanging here, Holly. So no worries. Uh, yes, and just to point out to people, um, Holly, perhaps to find the word fecal for everyone because that's our scientific term. Oh yeah, I um, please let me know if I use any words. You know, the thing about studying biology is it's like learning a whole new vocabulary. Um, so fecal is just poop, and. Um, and so it's a, you know, a non-invasive sample that most pet parents are familiar with. Um, and so what I try to do is to figure out how much information we can get out of, of fecal samples so that we can try and better get better insights into what's going on inside. And I'm just focused on um, cats and dogs at this point, no people. But um, so yeah, so we are doing a study. Um, this is sort of the, the full title. It's a, a bit of a mouthful. So we're looking at bacteria in poop um, and how the um, composition or the different kinds of bacteria might be related to, um, in this case, um, golden retrievers who had received a fatal diagnosis of lymphoma or hemangiosarcoma 
and then we're comparing them with similarly aged individuals who did not have such a diagnosis. And we're using samples that were collected by the HEROES owners as well as veterinarians for the girls project. Um, we're, um, there's a lot of people contributing to this because at this point we're, we've done about 600 samples and we're looking to do more. Um, Animal Biome is doing the sequencing to look at what bacteria are there. So we're looking at the DNA of the bacteria. And then um, Hills Pet Nutrition actually is helping with the project, which I'll explain a little bit more, where they took the frozen poop samples and it helped us divide them into small pieces so that we could do the analysis with actually without having to thaw them, which could change the results. So next slide. So one of the central aims for the girls is to identify risk factors that are associated with certain fatal cancers that are common in golden retrievers. Next slide, please. So I'm sure probably you're all aware, but um, cancer is the leading cause of death in dogs. And um, neoplasia refers to sort of um, tumors, some of them are benign, um, but in terms of if you're looking at mortality, then these would be the ones that are not. Um, next slide, please. And of the dog breeds, this is just a, zooming in on a table from a really nice um, seminal article looking at mortality in dogs um, over a 20-year period. Um, zooming in on the golden retrievers, they have the highest percentage of death due to neoplasia. Next slide, please. So um, while the, I think the central aim of the project has been to focus on host genetic factors, um, there is interest in environmental risk factors and the environment also includes the gut microbiome. Um, the microbiome has been shown in, especially in human research, that it can play a role in the development of some forms of cancer. Colorectal cancer is sort of one that's very clearly connected to the gut microbiome. And here's a nice study that came out a few years ago, looking at dogs with colorectal epithelial tumors and looking at the kinds of bacteria that they found to be associated with um, tumors in this, in this region of the, um, of the rectum. Next slide, please. So what is a fecal microbiome? That's another buzzword, right? So basically it's, we're looking at poop and we're looking at the microorganisms in it, and that includes bacteria, archaea, fungi, protozoa, algae, and viruses. And really algae actually we mean like protus. Um, but often what people really mean is that they're just looking at the bacteria. Ultimately, we'd like to look at more of these other groups of microbes as well. Next slide, please. So why do we care about the gut microbiome? Well, it, it, it's something that we, didn't really have the tools to look at until after um, DNA, DNA sequencing techniques developed a lot after the Human Genome Project. Um, and, and it's been likened now to being like another organ in our bodies that we didn't realize that we had. And it plays pivotal roles in health. So it, not just digestion, but also the production and metabolism of vitamins and bile acids. Um, it's been implicated in obesity and endocrinology, neoplasia, colonization resistance, so protection of the biofilms from pathogen invasion. There's a gut brain axis, there's a gut liver axis, now there's like a gum gut axis. Um, and then immunity inflammation are really um, very clearly linked where 70% of the immune cells in the body are found in the GI tract. Next slide, please. So for this, for this study, what we're, we're doing, and I have to say this is a very um, first presentation, we're still um, processing samples, but what we're aiming to do is to look at the fecal microbiomes or basically poop samples from the first golden retrievers who have died from lymphoma or, hermangi or hermangiosarcoma and compare them with dogs from the same cohort, so the same age group who remained apparently cancer-free. Of course, right, we can't tell um, sometimes if, the, if there's a cancer that's been undiagnosed. And what we're really looking at is to see if we can identify any bacterial biomarkers that might indicate disease state and um, see if some of these might've been predictive. Maybe we could identify if they arose, you know, hopefully, you know, sometime before the diagnosis so that potentially they could be used 
in the future to improve diagnostics. Next slide, please. So this might look familiar to you all. So um, the um, heroes in the study are um, get to go to the veterinarian once a year and submit samples. So next slide, please. And um, among the samples that are collected, um, what I'm really, what's really interested in is what's in the biobank. So um, there are fecal samples that have been collected and stored at ultra low temperatures, minus 80. There are also other samples, blood and urine and hair and toenails. Um, for this project, we're focusing on the poop. Next slide, please. And so um, this is just the instructions from for the veterinarian to obtain a fecal sample during the visit. Um, a large sample was collected for clinical testing and then the small um, tube is what went into the biorepository. Next, um, next slide, please. So the first part of this project really involved taking that, that sample, which is frozen, and actually there's like a spoon in the, in the tube and the poop is frozen on the spoon. And we didn't wanna thaw the sample in order to do the analysis because every time you thaw a frozen sample and then freeze it again, you degrade the quality of it and the signature that we might get of any of these biomarkers. But fortunately, there's a really cool instrument that's been developed that allows you to take a, a frozen sample and keep it frozen while you basically chisel out um, subsamples or aliquots. And um, we're very fortunate that Kieran Panikers lab at Hills Pet Nutrition volunteered to take the 600 samples and, and aliquot them so that we got two sub samples from each of them as well as the parent samples. So this was a tremendous amount of work that we're very grateful for. Next slide, please. So um, the, using the, uh, the data commons, um, we were, the Morris Animal Foundation identified which cases we should focus on and then selected controls. Um, so we were trying to age match them. And this is just showing that we had 33 cases so far. Um, there are more coming, I think, and um, 79 controls. The age of diagnosis was averaged about seven years um, and or 83 months. And they were um, pretty close to 50-50 for male and female. Um, and we focused on these multicentric lymphoma or hemangiosarcoma. In, for these for these studies or these samples. Next slide, please. And this is just a way of looking at the data. So um, of the 33 dogs, um, here are the different diagnoses for the samples that we are looking at so far. Um, and then we've indicated the age of diagnosis with the younger ones having the larger bubble um, because it's that much more um, tragic. So we thought we'd emphasize young over the old um, with this. So there's there's a bunch of four-year-olds, um, anyway, going down to some nine-year-olds. And then we've indicated in color whether or not they received chemotherapy or not, or if we didn't know, based on the, the metadata that we have at this point. Um, we are still um, hoping to fill in a few things that we might not have um, perfectly sorted out yet. And uh, next slide, please. So this is just another way to look at it to, to sort of make it more clear that like basically 15 of the cases were hemangiosarcoma and then the next um, greatest group was the multicentric lymphoma group. Next slide, please. And then this is actually um, something we're still filling in. So these are the samples that we have actually received and sequenced so far, but I think there are additional samples coming. So um, but this is just showing you that the pets are on the Y axis, sort of the, the ver vertical axis. And then on along the horizontal is showing that they um, have up to eight annual exams. Um, and so we're hoping as much as possible to fill this in where, where there are samples so that we can look over time at how the bacteria in the fecal sample or the poop sample might've changed. Next slide, please. So we are actually looking at a gene that is a, considered a marker for bacteria. 
and we're so we just are using a standardized extraction method. We are doing um basically targeting a specific gene, amplifying it, and then sequencing it using an Illumina sequencer. Next slide, please. And then one of the things that you can look at when you you get the data for what bacteria were found in the sample is you can look at um, what we call alpha diversity, which is really just how many different kinds or types of bacteria did we find. And this is showing, um, these are actually control samples and so none of these dogs had a cancer diagnosis comparing male and females. Um, the NA indicates that we're maybe still have a couple metadata um, fields that we need to correct. Um, but we didn't see any differences with, um, with sex. But we will be comparing the two different groups of the dogs with the cancer diagnosis to the, the ones that did not have one. Next slide, please. And then this is what we call a stacked bar chart, just showing the top 20 groups of bacteria that we're finding in these samples. And um, these are three different individual dogs over time. And so one of them we have so far had six samples taken over the first eight years. And so one of the things we're able to do is look at how the dog's microbiome might have changed over time and, um, and then see if we see any differences when we, we look at similar um, trajectories for the dogs that ended up developing cancer. And one thing you can see is that there are, of course, differences between individuals, um, like the one on the right has a lot more blue in it. Um, and the one maybe on the far left has um, more yellow compared to the one on the right. And the one in the middle has a lot more orange. So these are just different kinds of bacteria, but they provide a signature um, in front of wealth of data that we can sort of dig into. Next slide, please. And then ultimately what we're gonna be doing is testing for differences between these case and control groups. And I'm just going back to um, the, that figure from the study with colorectal cancer in dogs. And so we'll, we're aiming to identify whether or not there are groups of bacteria that are associated with the cancer diagnosis or, or not. Um, and then the figure on the right is a heat map just for a, a different classifier model that we had used. Um, in this case, actually, we were able to identify um, whether an, an animal is being fed a dry diet or not with like 96% accuracy. So we're hoping to be able to do that with these kinds of cancer diagnoses as well. Next slide, please. And then it actually, um, I guess that's it. I wanted to make sure I had time for questions. And um, also I want you to feel free to reach out to me. You can email me at holly at animalbiome.com. Fantastic, thank you, Holly. And actually, I also want to acknowledge Hills Pet Nutrition here because I found was quite surprised that there's a piece of equipment that can take a small frozen poop sample for us. And that was absolutely vital. And I, I think that was you, Holly, who put us in touch with them. Yes, Jennifer Rudosevich at Hills Pet Nutrition gave me a tour and I saw that instrument and it's, it was turned out to be just what was needed for this project. Yeah, because as those of you who have hero dogs know, you just kind of get that lump of poop and put it in the container. And as Holly said, we don't want to destroy that just, just for one study. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to get some questions started here. Um, and just to be clear, so you haven't started comparing the dogs with cancer yet with the dogs that have them, but we will get you back when you have those results. That's right. It's, it's early. We just received the second batch because it took a lot of work to, to do those um, aliquots of the frozen samples. They're under yeah. liquid nitrogen while they're doing this coring. It's a big project. Yeah, this is a big project and Animal Biome has been very generous in doing this for us. So let's just talk about the microbiome and cancer, because I noticed that study you were talking about done previously was look, looking at dogs that actually had kind of colon cancer. So the bacteria are right there, the tumors right there. And some of our dogs have gastrointestinal lymphoma, so the cancer's right there. But what about all our other dogs where the cancer is actually in a different part of the body? I mean, what are people saying about the relationship between those cancers and the microbiome sitting there in the intestinal tract? Well, I mean, this is a good question. You're probably going to stretch my limits if, since I'm not a veterinarian. But, um, the, you know, be, because 
so much of the immune system it is um, occurs along the GI tract, um, and basically one of the one of the common models that we have for why we think cancer arises relates to chronic inflammation. There, so the, the link with GI lymphoma is, seems very clear, right? Like, so they they think it's chronic inflammation that basically contributes to the development of cancer. Um, but you can imagine that it when the um, the gut becomes like chronically inflamed, then you start to have a breakdown of the barrier that's protecting the body from pathogens and other things coming in through from the gut into the blood but the bloodstream. So well, I would say I don't have a hypothesis for how it might be contributing to these cancers. The gut microbiome is just so foundational to health that it, it seems like it's worth taking a look. And then based on what, if we find any pattern with certain groups of bacteria contributing, um, then, then we might work on developing some hypotheses for what, what they specifically might be doing, the roles that they might be playing. Yeah, we're very early in this field with people as well. So, I mean, it's another value of the study. We took all these samples before these dogs were actually diagnosed. So looking forward to that. Okay, we have some questions piling up here. Uh, someone's asked, is this an international study? I just want to answer that. No, it isn't. Uh, so this is just involving golden retrievers in the United States. Uh, right, we've got a, a few questions here about probiotics, actually. Uh, let, let's go through some of those. So do you recommend using probiotics? And we've all seen these things for people as well, for healthy dogs. And are there any reasons not to do that? So I, I have a different view than many people um, because I've been a, a sort of a proponent of, of more the fecal transplant approach for restoring gut health because those are native dog bacteria. And, and whereas the probiotics on the market today are mostly soil and yogurt bacteria, I think if the dog is healthy and has uh, the right mix of microbes that it got from mom, it doesn't need to be on probiotics to maintain health. It's kind of like vitamins, you know, if you don't if you don't have a vitamin deficiency, you shouldn't need to take them. But you know, I think probiotics are a useful tool. They've been shown to help with diarrhea. I tend to lean more towards the yeast-based probiotics like Saccharomyces, because um, I've done studies that showed that it didn't compete with the native gut bacteria, which is um, we're finding that antibiotics is causing a lot of harm to the native gut bacteria in dogs, just especially the overuse of, of metronidazole and things like that. All right, so if the dog's not really showing any signs of disease, you, you wouldn't really bother with that? No, healthy diet should be all, all that's needed. I think that's a, a very good answer to that question. Um, yeah, so someone here is asking, I think I've kind of asked it already, but you know, is part of the research to determine whether changes in the microbiome cause the cancer or does the cancer cause the changes in the gut microbiome? Does anyone know the answer to that? Yeah, no, this is an excellent question um, for the whole field. Um, I'd say it's a, a chicken and egg question. Um, I mean, like we just don't know the answer to that, but in this case, we're not trying to say that it, it was causal, but we're hoping that maybe it can be an indicator that we could try to use to help dogs in the future get diagnoses earlier and probably in combination with other other blood work i'll be circular in other words yeah uh, yeah we a, don't know a, <laughs> sweet second question here i think this is a good question actually i'm not sure i know the answer but have we identified which of these dogs you're looking at might be on probiotics well i can tell usually um right. because there's some of the, the probiotic groups that are um species that are so popular are not typical in older dogs. And so if I see lots of lactobacillus, I know that either the dog is eating a diet with a lot of milk in it, or they're getting a probiotic with, with that group in it. Interesting that you can tell. Um, somebody else here is asking a question on dry diets. And yes, we are looking at whether diets are dry or wet for all sorts of reasons. Um, are you looking at that with these dogs? Does having a dry diet change the microbiome as opposed to a wet diet? But I actually need to dig more into what data we have for each of the dogs that were, are being included in the study because there, there are some things we could look at. Um, but in terms of, in general, um, yeah, like within um, the work that 
my company has done, we've sequenced more than 20,000 samples. And so we are able to look, and we've done like 15 studies for food and supplements companies. So we have a pretty good sense of how diet can affect the microbiome. There's pretty large and growing public um, literature on this. A uh, dry diet has um, often more fiber than um, like a fresh or raw diet. So you can see a really clear um, difference like difference between those diets when you look at the gut bacteria, because the bacteria really respond to macronutrients like protein, fiber, carbohydrates. Yeah, so I guess it's it's too early to say really whether the type of diet, the microbiome, the cancer, we, we've got a lot more work to do there. Well, to link and those. nobody knows, I would say diet is kind of like politics. <laughs> People it are very is. passionate about their diet. And we, we need longitudinal studies to know if one is better than another. We just can't tell from a, you know, two month study. Like a lot of the nutrition studies are really very short term. Yeah, we're at the very beginning of this people, but this this is a huge topic and Holly's getting us started on it. A few questions here, you know, um, we have a lot of hemangiosarcoma cases in our study and they're often found pretty late. Do you think there's any hope here that microbiome is going to be an early detection or a method of early detection of cancer? Well, I don't know. Um, I'm just going to, we're going to see if we can find that. Um, but it, it's another, I think, very promising thing with microbiome is that it can, in some cases, help with some of the symptoms. So even if you have a fatal diagnosis, like being like we, I mean, early on helped a cat with advanced GI lymphoma, had chronic diarrhea, and we're able to use, I mean, we're, we're in the future, we're hoping to have microbial cocktails, but we were able to use a fecal transplant to resolve that diarrhea. So even though the cat only had a couple more months, it didn't have to have terrible diarrhea every day. So I think the microbiome is very promising for alleviating some of the symptoms. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, part of, part of the treatment as well as an early diagnostic. Uh, we have a question here about histiocytic sarcoma. We've actually seen more of those cases in the study than we expected. I don't think we've got those in your study yet, have we? Um, I would say our numbers are not quite large enough, but uh, yeah, just to the person who asked that question, we've got our eye on histiocytic sarcoma because uh, we have actually made it into an end point now because we saw enough cases of it. Okay, it to, sorry. Janet, do you think it would be good to include with these this in this study? We could look at it. Uh, certainly the numbers are not at all uh, where we're at with hemangiosarcoma lymphoma. But yes, thank you for that question. We'll take a look. I think that's uh, in, an interesting question, particularly as it's one of those immune cell cancers, you know, that we were talking about. Um, okay, got a scientific question here. Uh, seems like the scientific evidence for probiotic supplements in some situations is getting stronger and stronger, but I'm curious if there have been any good controlled clinical studies in dogs yet for any specific probiotic interventions. There are a few actually really nice studies, um, just the sort of top ones that come to mind. I'm, as I mentioned, I'm a, a, a fan of the Saccharomyces aspilardii. They're I mean, with humans and with dogs, there's hundreds of studies. Um, I know VizBiome has also done some really nice studies with um, like Texas A&M. So there are, I would say some probiotics where they have nice research. There are probably a thousand on the market though, where they've never done any study on them at all. So it's a very, it's variable. So it's a, it's, so it just, I guess it depends on which one you're interested in. Um, I also should add that Purina has done a lot of research around the probiotics that they have on the market. Right. And, you know, we can't recommend any specific ones here, uh, but no. I would say look for ones where people have done a little bit of research on it at least. Yeah. Um, here's a good question. What are your diet recommendations to limit inflammation? Uh, and has there been a correlation with raw diet? Is there any specific diet where we think the inflammation will be less? So, it's interesting because, um, you know, prior to moving in, um, out of academia and into this world, I wasn't as familiar with raw diet, but a lot of people who had, especially like a cat with IBD or um, GI lymphoma found that a raw diet was helpful. Um, and what I, we've done a study looking at raw, a raw versus a conventional kibble and found that the microbiome completely rearranges 
when you switch from one to the other. I think it could be useful a way to sort of, if the microbiome is, gets sort of stuck in a bad state, it can be a way to rearrange it. Um, we're not yet sure if the effect of the raw diet is because it's raw or if it's because it's a high protein diet. So there's still sort of more work that needs to be done. And it turns out that nutrition research is complicated because cooking the food causes very large differences. So you can't like create a raw diet that's exactly the same as a kibble diet. Yeah, and I would say to your hero owners, the diets for your dogs are extremely varied, extremely. Uh, so we, we're still looking at some of that data. Okay, I'm just going to throw one last question at you. Um, the location of the cancers, I mean, we, we've, we've got some GI lymphomas that we pulled out, uh, but the other ones, are you looking at that or are we too varied there with where those cancers are located? Well, I... I'm, well, I shouldn't be hoping, but I expect as more cases come in, we'll be able to fill in more and be able to make some of those comparisons. But I don't think we have enough samples yet. Yeah, and you know, just to tell everyone watching, yes, a lot of our hemangiosarcomas are spleen and or heart. That's where we tend to see them arising. A lot of our lymphomas, by the time we diagnose them, are what we call multicentric, which was on Holly's graph before, where it's involving multiple lymph nodes and sites through the body. And at that point, it can be pretty hard to know where the cancer originally came from. Well, thank you very much, Holly. If we have a bit of time at the end, we might have some more questions but I'll let you off the hook for now this is a very interesting topic in all sorts of ways and we'll move on to our next speaker and I'd like to thank Animal Biome as well. Thank you so much. Okay so our next speaker we're very lucky to have her with us uh, is Dr. Marta Tugel uh, from Alanco. So Marta if you could perhaps introduce yourself tell us a bit about your background and then we'll get started on your talk. Thanks so much, Janet. Yeah, and thanks for including me today. I was really excited uh, to be asked to meet with you guys. And just a little bit of background, I am a veterinarian that consults with Elanco Animal Health now, but prior to joining um, Elanco and the veterinary industry, I was a private practitioner for six years. Um, and prior to that, I was a little girl that grew up with the most wonderful golden retriever who lived to be 16 years old. So um, I am one of you in spirit. So with that, I would love to get started talking about canine osteoarthritis with you. This is something that's very near and dear to my heart. That same golden retriever, Sophie, that I just mentioned uh, was diagnosed with osteoarthritis or OA, as we can shorten it, uh, when she was only six years old. And so she lived for at least 10 years uh, with OA having to be managed. And I think that there's just a lot of misinformation out there about OA and dogs. And there's a lot of new information that we have that I wanted to make sure this group is aware of just so that, um, you know, from, from a dog owner's perspective, from a dog mom or dog dad's perspective, what we really need to know about OA and dogs for our current dogs and our future dogs and um, just to help spread the good word. So next slide, please. To start off with, I just wanted to make sure um, to share sort of the impact of OA. So we know now that OA affects at least one in four dogs over the age of one. And this number keeps climbing. The more research that we do, the more we find out how many dogs actually suffer from OA that maybe we didn't know even had it. And you can see here too, that it's the number one cause of chronic pain. And some of you may have family members or friends who suffer with chronic pain. I hope you don't. Uh, but if you do, you might know that chronic pain is different from what we would consider acute pain. So acute pain might be something like touch, touching a hot stove and recognizing that it's hot and you shouldn't touch it. And so you move your hand away and that serves a purpose to protect us. What chronic pain is, is actually a type of pain that persists even when there is no actual stimulus or injury to the patient. And this is true in dogs and also in people. And so chronic pain is really a disease state of its own, kind of takes on a life of its own um, and can be much more difficult to treat. So chronic pain is a real problem in aging pets. Cancer can also cause chronic pain. So many of you may have um, more personal experience with that in your pets as well. Next slide, please. Another sort of misconception about OA that I wanted to bring up is that we're used to thinking of arthritis in people as an old age disease or 
being due to wear and tear, right? So you think as you get older, your joints wear down, you end up with arthritis, with the exception of things like rheumatoid arthritis that can strike people at a younger age. And in dogs, this is not the case. It's not an old dog disease and it's not a disease of wear and tear. In dogs, OA actually comes from conformational origins, which just means that it's something they're born with. It's the way that they're built. Um, they are literally born with joints that are dysplastic, meaning they're not in the correct alignment. Um, they don't have the right structural um, surface, and this can come from genetic variability, this comes from breeding over the long term, and it just comes from developmental differences between dogs and people. We see some similar types of OA in horses as well, um, but because this comes from conformational origins rather than wear and tear, it's actually a disease of young dogs. So we think of OA as an old dog disease, but in reality, it's a disease of young dogs. Next slide, please. And so because of this, and because we know that most cases aren't diagnosed until dogs are quite a bit older, so 50% of cases aren't diagnosed in dogs between eight to 13 years of age, but because it starts in younger dogs, there's actually a gap in time between when dogs start suffering from OA and when they start getting treated. And we'll talk a little bit about why this exists and what can be done to help close this gap. Next slide, please. I mentioned chronic pain earlier, and this is one of the leading experts in orthopedic health in the United States saying that we know that dogs with OA can develop central sensitization quickly after the onset of pain. And what central sensitization means is actually wind up of the nervous system or amplification of pain signals. If you go to the next slide, please. This is what actually causes chronic pain. So when you have a painful stimulus that continues to persist beyond the point where it would be helpful to an animal, remember we talked about the example of touching a hot stove, that's helpful pain uh, signal, right? That helps you move your hand away and not burn yourself. But there becomes a point when the pain signal is not helpful anymore. And that's really when we get to chronic pain. And to get there, we get there through what's called wind up or central sensitization of the nervous system. And so then the nervous system is basically just firing even when there is no stimulus. Um, and, and as Dr. Lascelles said, this is actually something that can happen pretty early on. And this is why it's so important to recognize OA earlier and start treatment earlier so that we have a better chance at keeping our dogs mobile, keeping them doing the things that they love as they age and not letting their mobility um, be the reason that we have to put them down, which oftentimes it is very sadly. Next slide, please. So why is it so difficult to detect OA in dogs? If they could just tell us, this would be a lot easier. Um, but the problem in dogs is that the signs can be extremely subtle. Um, dogs are not complainers. Golden retrievers above all else <laughs> are not complainers. Um, and they're really masters at hiding pain. And so what a lot of the early symptoms of OA look like are actually very subtle behavioral changes that you would probably not associate with pain. You might just think it's a change in your dog because your dog's a year older or you know, your dog has developed a new behavior or something like that. So it can be very subtle things. It can be something as simple as not getting in bed to sleep with you anymore and preferring to sleep on the floor. So maybe avoiding trying to jump up onto a higher surface. Um, it could be something like that where they prefer a different entrance or exit from the house rather than one where they would have to use stairs. They start to avoid things that are more difficult for them. It could be that your dog suddenly became more sensitive to noise. Um, they can develop sort of fear behaviors when they're in pain. And so sometimes they might develop anxiety or like I mentioned, noise phobia, so even thunderstorm phobia. Sometimes that's one of the first things that we notice when in reality, the dog's actually having some pain associated with um, arthritis. So it would be a lot easier if they would just tell us, but since they can't, we've been working really hard to try to figure out ways to help make it easier to identify who these dogs are so that we can get them started on treatment sooner. Next slide, please. And that's where this tool has come from. So the Canine Osteoarthritis Staging Tool, or COAST as the acronym is called, is a tool to help veterinarians 
work with dog owners to identify OA at an earlier stage um, and to proactively screen for it rather than to wait until dogs are really mobility impaired to start any sort of treatment. And this is what we've been working with the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study on incorporating into the annual exam so that we, even though the population of dogs is a bit older in this study, that we can encourage veterinarians and you guys as the pet owners to really proactively screen the dogs, make sure that we catch anybody who hasn't already been caught with OA and get them on the treatment that they need. Next slide, please. And the premise of COAST is that there are really two groups of OA dogs out there. There are really young dogs that might have risk factors for OA but don't yet actually have the disease but we can catch them too if we really you know, look at the dog's history, talk to an owner. Um, and then there are dogs that already have clinical OA or are already showing symptoms, and so they need to be started on treatment. And you can see here with that first group of dogs, the ones that are considered preclinical, so they don't actually have symptoms of OA yet, they don't have the disease, um, but they do have risk factors. What are those risk factors? And they're listed here below for you. So, when you think about breed, golden retrievers are absolutely one of the breeds that are at risk because they are prone to some of those developmental disorders that I mentioned early on. So elbow dysplasia, hip dysplasia um, are very common in golden retrievers. My own golden retriever, Sophie, that I mentioned had uh, spondylosis of her sacral spine, and that's also quite common um, in the breed and can cause um, arthritis in the spine and also in the hind end. Um, and nerve pain and muscle loss over time. So there are all sorts of things that Goldens are more prone to anyway. And then you look at some of the other things here, intense activity, some Goldens can be quite intense <laughs> um, and love to have great fun. And if you think about dogs that love to chase balls or jump after Frisbees or things like that, they might be more prone to stress on the joints, um, especially joints that are not shaped appropriately, right? So I mentioned this is not a wear and tear disease, but if you do have joints that you were born with that maybe aren't 100% normal to begin with, and then you do intense activity, you do agility, um, you have a dog that loves to swim or chase balls, then, then those dogs will be more likely to have arthritis at an earlier age too. Now joint injury and joint surgery, the most common one that a lot of people might be familiar with is having an ACL injury. Dogs in general, larger breed dogs especially, but even smaller breeds, are very prone to ACL injuries. And so I imagine some of you have had your own dogs undergo ACL repair, or at least have had to talk to your veterinarian about a suspected ACL injury. And what gets missed sometimes is that after that injury, there's absolutely arthritis in the joint. Oftentimes before the injury, there was arthritis in the joint. Um, and so part of treating that is not just fixing the ACL, but also having a long-term management plan for the arthritis. And then further to the right here, we have excess body weight and age. I cannot underemphasize the role that excess body weight plays in osteoarthritis. There was a really landmark study done by Purina looking at the impact of just weight restriction um, on the prevalence of OA and just keeping dogs very, very slightly underweight um, actually is protective against the development of radiographic signs. So on x-rays actually seeing osteoarthritis in these dogs. So even dogs that are just a little bit chubby are much more at risk for OA than dogs that are of a healthy weight. And then with increasing age, that's just because things do get worse. So again, it starts as a young dog, but they're more likely to have it even as an old dog, um, even if they were born with this condition that, that didn't start to show symptoms until they were a couple of years old. Next slide, please. And the way that COAST works is quite simple. Again, it's a tool for your vet to use, but there's a very important part of it that involves owner input because we talked about the fact that the signs are very difficult to determine and can be very subtle in dogs. And so understanding the behavior of your dog at home is very important um, in order for your vet to get a clue that maybe something has changed or maybe there is something abnormal. So dog mom and dog dad input is key to this. And then once your vet has that, they incorporate that into this first step of grading the dog overall. So they think, okay, what is, um, you know, what is the dog doing at home? And then how does the dog look overall in the clinic? What does the dog's posture and motion look like? Which we'll talk about in a minute. 
And then also looking at the individual joints and actually putting the joints through a range of motion, doing an orthopedic exam uh, to feel for any abnormalities. And then that actually generates a stage of disease. So just like with other disease processes, there's now a stage that we can assign to determine how severe the OA is. Next slide, please. And this is how the stages look. So I mentioned to you that there are preclinical, so dogs that don't actually have osteoarthritis yet, but they might be at risk. They're listed on the top. And then the clinical dogs are the dogs that have signs of OA and need to be on treatment. They're in the bottom. And so on the top, you can see that stage zero means that this is a normal dog with no risk factors. So I hate to say this to you guys, but no, none of your dogs are stage zero, because if you look at stage one, these are clinically normal dogs, but OA risk factors are present. And so all of your dogs have at least the risk factor of being a golden retriever or of being of advanced age. And so even at their first puppy visit, your dogs would have been a stage one if they're golden retrievers. And that's important because the idea is then for this to help facilitate conversations with owners of these young dogs so that you understand the importance of keeping them at a healthy weight, the importance of being on the lookout for these very subtle early signs so that we can get treatment started um, as soon as your dog becomes a stage two, which is mild OA, rather than catching them in those moderate or severe stages, stages three and four, when that chronic pain may already be set in and they may be more difficult to treat. Next slide, please. So when we look at the dog overall as a veterinarian in the clinic, some of the things that we're looking for are just subtle changes in the way that the dog might hold their body. So changes in the posture of the dog. And I love this example here because a lot of people look at it and I want, to, I want you to look first at the dog on the left that's sitting very squarely next to his owner in the exam room. Sorry, I think that's a she. And she's sitting there with her hind legs nicely flexed underneath herself and sitting squarely compared to the dog on the right that's sitting on, you know, she has her right hip down and has kicked her left leg out to the side. And a lot of people see their dog sit like this and wouldn't know that this is abnormal. But the reason that this dog is sitting like this is because her left knee hurts and she can't flex it fully. So she cannot put it underneath her body the way that she should to sit squarely. So she sits like this in order to keep that left leg extended or stretched out a bit rather than flexing it all the way. She doesn't complain about it. She may not even limp very much, but she has adjusted her posture in a way to protect her body um, from feeling more pain. And so this is just an example of a very common abnormal posture that you might see in a dog that has had a little ACL injury or has arthritis in the knee, for example. Next slide, please. These ones are a little bit more subtle um, if you're not used to looking at dog posture, but I'd like to explain them to you as well because I think they're another important example. The top one is actually normal posture in a dog. And so this is a dog that's standing very squarely. If you look at the bottom two pictures, what you'll see on the left is that this dog has actually shifted its weight forward. And so now the front limbs are further underneath the dog's body than the dog on the top. So it's a subtle difference, but you might see that what this dog has done is what we call hind limb offloading, meaning that he has shifted his weight up onto his front limbs because there's pain in the hind limbs. Okay, so he's trying to avoid bearing as much weight on the limbs that have pain in them as possible. What you can also see is that his back is very slightly rounded compared to the dog in the top. And that's not just the way this dog is built, that's part of shifting the weight off of the hind limb and towards the front limbs. And this is a quite, this is a very young dog. This dog's only three years old, I believe. Um, and so this is one of those subtle early signs that if you're not looking for it, it would be very easy to miss. But if you're looking for it because you want to find OA early so that you can intervene before the chronic pain sets in, this is the type of thing that your veterinarian would be looking for. The dog on the right on the bottom is doing a very similar thing. Um, it's a little bit harder to see in this big dog, but the other thing that you'll see is he sort of has his back legs camped out behind him. And so that's accomplishing a similar goal. So he's trying to get weight off of the area that hurts and he's shifting the weight forward because of it and then rounding the back um, in order to do that. And so I think this is a dog that had bilateral hip dysplasia. And I don't have the video for you today because I wasn't sure if the video would work, but one of the classic signs of hip dysplasia is what we call the pelvic wiggle. So when the dog walks away from you, it looks like the dog's 
swaying his butt back and forth. And it can look really cute, but what's actually happening is that the dog's doing that to avoid flexing the hip joint. And so even though the pelvic wiggle is kind of adorable in a young dog, it's actually a sign of hip dysplasia um, that warrants further investigation. Next slide, please. So what do we do once we find OA? <clears throat> I just wanted to show you a summary of what the expert treatment recommendations are. They of course vary by the individual dog, the underlying health conditions, um, and of course, owner and vet preferences, but this is a good starting point. And so you can see even in those at-risk dogs that don't yet have OA, so they don't even have OA yet, there are still owner education and lifestyle modifications that can be made. So even at that first puppy visit, these are things that could be talked about with owners of a golden retriever, for instance. So weight optimization, Again, I cannot um, overemphasize the importance of weight management when it comes to OA. Exercise or rehab that's appropriate for each patient stage. So when we think about dogs that have abnormal joints um, that are at risk for OA, it's important to limit the, the level of activity that they have. So they should be active, activity is important, but they should not be doing intense activities. Um, so things like, you know, dock jumping or <laughs> repetitive motions that are going to be very stressful on abnormal joints anyway. So controlled leash exercise is recommended for most of those dogs that are already at risk. And it can be quite a bit of exercise. Um, Sophie, the golden retriever that I told you about, did, uh, my mom was an avid runner growing up and she ran with my mother up until the last couple of months of her life um, when she couldn't anymore. Now she ran much slower and she did a very slow jog um, or walk sometimes, <laughs> but I think keeping them active is really important. It's just the type of activity that needs to be modified. And then there is expert recommendation for an EPA rich or omega-3 fatty acid supplement or diet. This is the only type of supplement that's really been shown to be effective in OA. So there are lots and lots of supplements out there. And a lot of people have sort of a favorite one that maybe they've had some success with, but the only one that's really been proven through scientific studies to be effective um, are those EPA rich or omega-3, you know, think fish oil type supplements. Now, once dogs actually have OA, the most important treatment that you can give them is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug or NSAID. And there are lots of them on the market. You can think of things like Rimadyl or Carprofen, Deramax, Prevacox, Galaprant. These are all NSAIDs. And these are really the cornerstone of treating osteoarthritis. And they are not just a pain pill. I wanted to make sure to emphasize that with this group. I think a lot of people think of them as a pain pill, um, and so we want to use them sparingly, and that's actually an old way of looking at them. What NSAIDs do is not just treat the pain, but they actually treat the underlying inflammation that's driving that chronic pain. And because osteoarthritis is a chronic progressive disease, it never stops. And so you can't just use an NSAID on a day when, you're when your dog's not doing as well. They actually need to be on it daily, even in the more mild stages. A lot of dogs in just that stage two, so when you first detected it, might be able to be tapered down or be through the drug less often. But once dogs are in the moderate to severe stage, so most older dogs, they actually require daily therapy with the NSAID. So it's important not to think of it as a pain pill, but, but to actually think of it as something that's treating the underlying disease and that chronic pain state. And then on top of that, there are some joint specific therapies, so intraarticular injections, um, and some really novel therapies out there for specific types of OA, like for elbow arthritis, for instance. And then also pick your poison, a million adjunct therapies. So everything from other prescription medications like gabapentin and amantadine um, to things like stem cell therapy and acupuncture and chiropractic. So there are a lot of adjunct therapies. And the idea is that if you go to the next slide, please, once you get the foundation right, so you start with the owner education, the lifestyle modification, you get that weight and diet optimized and you get the dog on an NSAID, that then you monitor the dog and you add in those adjunct therapies that work best for that dog as the disease progresses and based upon vet and owner preferences. So rechecking frequently is really important. And I think this might be where I ended. So we might actually have a few minutes for questions. If you'll go to the next slide, I believe we're to that point. Great. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. That was a very interesting talk. It's certainly been a wake-up call, I think, for us to recognise that osteoarthritis starts at a young age, right? I mean, when, when did that first start being recognised? That's right. Yeah, it's been a change and, you know, it's a paradigm shift for us as a profession. So I think that's important to recognize. It's not just that this is new information for dog owners. This is new information for a lot of veterinarians. Yeah, I would absolutely say that myself. And I was at vet school quite a while ago, but uh, it's definitely a shift <laughs> because we put it down for it's the same as, as for people. Okay, yeah, we have some great. questions here for you, so get ready. Uh, okay, uh, first question, here's a good one for you. My dog sways his butt when he walks, which you indicated is due to or could be OA, but he also lays frog dog, which everyone says means good hips. Is that true? <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of controversy over that sort of frog laying position. Um, I think in general, it is not normal. So I would definitely have your dog looked at. I have known some dogs that do it and they are totally fine. Um, and, you know, the pelvic wiggle, like I mentioned, can be a sign of hip dysplasia or of other OA pain that affects both hind limbs. So if both hind limbs are affected, they might sway their hips like that. Um, but it's definitely worth getting your dog looked at by your veterinarian and just pointing out these abnormal postures and motions for sure. Yeah, I would echo that. So we need, need a veterinarian looking at that dog. Um, mm -hmm. Another question, a little bit of a difficult one to ask someone from a Lanco, but <laughs> let's go for it. Um, are there sure. any recommended over-the-counter insides for dogs? Do you think that is a good idea? Oh, I think it's a great question to bring up. I appreciate you bringing it up. There are none. And unfortunately, there probably won't ever be because the FDA does not seem open to approving over-the-counter NSAIDs for dogs. Uh, we would like them to because pet owners do reach for over-the-counter NSAIDs because you're used to being able to get one for yourself. And unfortunately, all of the human versions can be quite toxic to dogs. So it's not safe to use them. Um, a lot of people will try to use aspirin and aspirin can be very toxic to dogs if it's not used at an appropriate dose. And so I don't recommend that at all. Another problem that we see with aspirin therapy is that some people might use it and then end up switching their dog to an NSAID that really is proven safe and effective in dogs. And then they experience a GI ulcer because they've been on aspirin previously. So um, there can be very severe, even deadly consequences of using over-the-counter medications. And it's, it's unfortunate that the FDA won't um, approve over-the-counter medications for dogs for OA. The reason they don't is that they want you to consult with your veterinarian and make sure that you have the underlying health of the dog monitored. So they do have a good reason to do it. Um, but the result, unfortunately, is that people just try human medications first and they are not safe for use in dogs. Very good point. Do not use human medications <laughs> for animals. They do not automatically transfer over to different species. If That's everyone could stick with us, we are going to run a little bit late in time, but please stick with us. We're going to keep going because we're getting some great questions here and I want yeah. uh, Mara to be able to answer them. Uh, just a, a quick question. What about Cosimin or Cosequin for this problem? Yeah, um, I like Cosequin as a joint supplement. And I mentioned to you that the only ingredient that's actually been clinically proven to be effective in dogs with OA are the omega-3 fatty acids or the EPA rich supplements. Um, but of all of the sort of general joint supplements out there, Cosequin made by Nutramax is really the only one that has um, any amount of study detail behind it in dogs so that we know that they at least absorb those levels of glucosamine and chondroitin and are safe. So I think you can feel like, you know, cosequin or desequin might help your dog and it, it probably won't hurt your dog. Whereas there are some supplements out there that might or might not help, but also might hurt. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody asked about CBD, but I'm happy to just jump right to it. Uh, well, I think CBD not. Is one of the <laughs> Okay. Well, it's one of the most commonly reached for, you know, now available supplements that people think of for pain or for aging animals. And uh, when we think of the supplement market, the big problem with the supplement market is that it's not regulated for safety. So your biggest concern should be, is it safe for my dog? If it hasn't been tested in dogs, we don't know that. Okay. And beyond that, when you look at products like CBD that may have ingredients sourced from overseas, it may be that there are actually toxic levels of heavy metals in some of these sort of, you know, marketed as very natural products. 
So I really encourage you to think about what we talked about in the end here and get the foundation right first. So start with appropriate diet, appropriate exercise and appropriate NSAID therapy for your dog. And then talk to your veterinarian about what else could we do? Let's start with those things first, see how my dog's doing and then decide if we need to spend money and add something else in or if that's enough and he's doing better. Great advice. I hope everyone heard that. <laughs> and yes, those heavy metals are a problem. We do think of it as natural yeah. plant medicine, but that's an issue for people as well. Okay, I've got a couple more and then we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, do you see differences in pet dogs versus performance dogs, which is something we see a lot in golden retrievers? So we've got some of these dogs yeah. doing obedience, agility, hunting, field events. Have you, have you seen differences there? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, one of the biggest differences is just that the performance dog owners might be a little more in tune with some of those subtle changes because they're used to seeing their dog's activity in a different way. You know, when we grow up with pet dogs or we have pet dogs, we see their activity differently than a performance or competitive animal where, um, you know, you're really watching the way that that dog moves all the time. So you might notice that they're not doing the polls the way that they did, or, you know, there's something very subtle in the way that they're performing that makes you wonder if something's wrong. And so um, I think we actually catch it earlier in those performance dogs or competitive dogs than we do in pet dogs. Um, in terms of OA prevalence, it's actually probably the same. It would just be sort of the age at which, you know, the symptoms might develop because again, remember they're born with it. And so um, they're born with the abnormal joint. And then it's just a matter of time before the bony changes start to happen. And the bony changes will happen more quickly if they undergo intense activity or if they're overweight. Competitive dogs tend not to be overweight. Pet dogs tend to be overweight. <laughs> Competitive dogs tend to have more intense activity. So, um, you know, it really comes down to those risk factors and I think our ability to detect the really subtle signs. It's complicated. Yeah. Okay, fun question. Um, our golden was on the small size and she wiggled from head to toe when she was greeting anyone. Was the wiggling a sign of OA? We had never seen this before in the first three goldens. <laughs> Great question. I, I've seen some full body wigglers too. Um, that could be different if she's, if she was only doing it when greeting people, it could have been an expression of excitement. Um, and, and certainly we see some dogs do that when I was in practice, I always joked, I would have loved to run a golden retriever only practice. Cause they were like the happiest patients I ever had happy to see me forgiving of anything that I had to do that, <laughs> that they didn't like. <laughs> I had many goldens walk into practice, carrying their own leashes, wagging their tails or doing a full body wiggle like that. So um, the full body wiggle doesn't alarm me as much when it's done with the tail lag and with all of the excitement that comes with it. But if the wiggle continues when the dog's just walking down the hall, then that certainly would be something I'd look into more. Excellent. Good answer. I'm just going to give you one more question because this sure. is something that comes to my mind as a dog owner. Yeah. And that is, you know, if the recommendation you're, you're detecting this mild OA and you're saying begin NSAIDs early and consistently, we want to get rid of that inflammation. Are there concerns, though, that you could be using these drugs consistently over quite some years? I mean, is, is that an issue? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's why people try to minimize NSAID use, you know, so I think the concern is, am I, well, there's several concerns. One is, is it safe to give a drug long term because of the way the drug works? And the second is, am I over medicating my dog or making my dog addicted to pain pills? And I think a lot of people worry about that, especially now with the opioid epidemic. So there is a little bit, you know, we've noticed just in the veterinary profession an aversion to chronic medication, um, especially related to pain. Now, the, the, what I want to reassure you guys of is that NSAIDs have been proven to be safe over the last 25 years in dogs. And so it is not safe to give a human NSAID to a dog, but it is safe to give an approved NSAID for a dog to dogs for the long term. Not all NSAIDs will work for every single dog. And so that's why you have to work closely with your veterinarian. And there are actually two kinds of NSAIDs out there now. So there are NSAIDs that work the traditional way like we have on the human side too, but to block the inflammation and pain 
at kind of a broader level. And those can be used for surgical pain and everything too. And then there's also a new NSAID that is called Galaprant that really only targets OA. So it's not as broad of an anti-inflammatory. It's not, it's designed for chronic use and it is a bit more targeted of a treatment. So some of you may have experience with that. And that's why a lot of veterinarians are recommending Galaprant now as an OA treatment, because it helps make it easier for us to continue that daily therapy that they need, especially as they get to the later stages. Because even once you get the inflammation under control, if you try to taper the ends of what happens is it just comes back. And so you can end up having your dog cycle in and out of these, you know, it's cyclical. Dogs can do okay for a while and then have a flare up and then do okay for a while and have a flare up. You don't know when that flare up's coming and you don't know how long it's gonna last. And so that's why the expert recommendation has morphed over the years. You know, we used to treat them for a few weeks at a time and then as needed, and now they're, they're really saying that it just has to be prolonged therapy once you get to those more advanced stages. Excellent. Right. I'm going to let you off the hook now. Thank you so much for answering those questions. We're going to yeah, move to. Our, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll all catch up at the end to thank everyone. We're going to move to our next speaker, Mara de Pena, who is one of our own. So Mara, perhaps if you could uh, tell us about your background and what you do at the foundation, and then we'll hear about the Golden Age project. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Mara. I'm one of the project managers here at the foundation, and I've been on the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study team for a little over three years now. Um, I have a background with a degree in animal sciences, and um, what I'm really here to talk to you about today is our Golden Age project in collaboration with Purina and Ilanka. You can go on to the next slide. So the Golden Age Project is a new optional part of the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study. And the aim of this sub-study is to track early symptoms of OA, as Mara was talking about, as well as canine cognitive dysfunction syndrome, which is kind of equated to Alzheimer's. If you go on to the next slide. So this additional questionnaire, um, it is optional, but we would love for you to opt in if you're a current Golden Retriever Lifetime Study participant. It's actually very brief. It should take you maybe an additional five minutes to complete. Um, as an owner in the study who's enrolled in the Golden Age sub-study, you'd complete this questionnaire every six months. As a veterinarian, you just have to complete this once a year, and that timing will be um, with the annual visit of the study dog. If you go on to the next slide. So the questionnaire um, consists of two validated staging tools. So we have the DISHA, which is the Cognitive Dysfunction Syndrome Evaluation Tool. And we have the LOAD questionnaire, which is the Liverpool Osteoarthritis in Dogs Index. If you go on to the next slide. Just wanted to go ahead and show you what this questionnaire looks like. So you can see it's, it's really not at all intimidating. It's pretty brief. This is the first page of two. Um, and page one just consists of the DISHA questionnaire. If you go on to the next slide, you'll see page two, and that consists of the load questionnaire, and that is actually it. That's the entirety of this golden age um, sub questionnaire. If you go to the next slide, I just wanted to provide an update on enrollment. So right now we have a little over 2,000 um, participants in the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study out of the original 3,044. And um, of those 2,000, we have a little over 1,000 enrolled in Golden Age, which is great. We would absolutely love to see more enrollment. So um, as you can see, we have 682 who have declined and 235 who haven't decided yet. And what I'd like to do in the next couple of slides is just show you how to enroll if you're in one of those groups and you're thinking, oh, this really isn't too bad of a survey, I might as well um, get that done. So let's go ahead and move on. So this is an example of what the Golden Retriever study portal looks like for someone who's enrolled. So once again, you do have to be participating in the Golden Retriever Lifetime Study to enroll your dog in the Golden Age sub-study. Um, but there is no age limit. Um, as Mara said, OA can happen in young dogs, and we want to make sure that we're capturing all these changes over the years of these dogs' lifetimes. So when you first log into your study portal, if it's been a while, you will actually see a pop-up window showing up talking about the Golden Age sub-study, asking you if you'd like to enroll. If you've ever exited that out or if you've declined it, you won't see that pop up again. So what you're going to want to do is go to that left hand side of your portal. And that's where you see that red circle there. And you can hit that golden age owner info hyperlink and that'll take you to the next slides page. 
this is what you'll see. So you'll see um, the option to manage your golden age questionnaire preferences and you'll see all of your dogs listed. So if you have more than one dog, there is an individual toggle per dog. So enrolling one of your dogs does not automatically enroll the other. So you're just gonna wanna toggle there. This is also where you can review resources like the golden age frequently asked questions page and an instructional webinar that'll tell you more about why we're doing this and what we're looking for. After you opt in on your order, owner portal, you'll see um, where you would usually see your annual owner questionnaire that needs to be done. You'll also see the golden age questionnaire. Once you hit that toggle to opt in your dog, an email will automatically go to your veterinarian letting them know about their portion. Um, but I do advise that you talk to them about it when you see them and let them know about this additional questionnaire. It's pretty brief. Um, and it's just really good to make sure that they're aware of all these new tools and they also have resources to reference in their portals as well. If you go on to the next slide. If you need any help with anything at all, the study team is here for you. We're available on 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mountain Time at this phone number or via email. And additionally, I did want to highlight we do have a new resource for everybody. We have volunteers who we've termed study buddies, and these are all volunteers who are currently in the study and are really excited to be able to help you guys out. Um, if you need any help completing your questionnaire, if you have any questions, if you need somebody after hours, the study buddies are here for you and here to provide that resource and their contact information is also right along that left hand side of your portal. All right, if you go on to the next slide. Thank you guys for hanging on um, a little bit later and any questions? So, you know, looking at these questionnaires, they look pretty short, right? Have, mm -hmm. have any of the participants indicated how much extra time that takes them? Yeah, usually people comment, wow, it was really quick. It was like less than five minutes. So please give us less than five minutes uh, because this information is so important to us scientifically. Um, Pam Kent is asking if we can email the Wiggle video referenced. Oh, well, Mana Tugel is off now. I'll, I'll, I'll ask her about that. And I think we'll finish there. Um, oh, someone's asked a good question here, Mara. My dog just died. Is it too late to participate? Yeah, so um, with the way that this substudy is made, unfortunately, um, it wouldn't make much scientific sense to start opting into the additional golden age because that is um, in tandem with the study questionnaires and um, the study visits. We do appreciate your interest and we do have some projects that are coming up that even those who have deceased dogs can enroll in. So keep an eye on your email for those. We do, we have all sorts of things about to happen. Uh, right, so we've, we've gone a bit late, but it was so interesting. I thought we should do that. I just wanna thank our speakers, Dr. Holly Gantz, Dr. Mara Tugel, Mara De Pena. I'd like to thank our partners, Animal Biome and Alanka. They give us so much in terms of their expertise. They've been contributing to the study and its scientific impact. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed seeing Mara from our team on here. Uh, put a face to the name. I'm sure some of you have talked to her in the call center. Uh, our next Golden Zoomies will most likely be in June. That will be our summer edition. It's going to be on the topic of the human-animal bond. And Emily has put a lot of work into getting some really exciting and great speakers. So just like to wish everyone a great day. Hope we'll see you next time. And thank you so much for attending.